I want to preface this video with a clear disclaimer. This is not a step-by-step -step tutorial. This is not expert advice. Electricity can be literally deadly. So unless you are already very comfortable working with both DC and AC power sources, lithium batteries, wiring, and your local requirements, just hire a qualified electrician to do it for you. Your life isn't worth the few quid you'd save not hiring a professional, so just do that. Right, now we have that clear, let's get to building my system. Now, as mentioned in the previous video, I'll link that in the cards above, I am building an off-grid system. That means I won't be connecting to my standard house wiring, uh, the grid itself, and that means that it's a little bit easier for my rented accommodation. I'm currently running everything from my shed and into my house with the aim of keeping it all relatively low cost while still being able to offset a reasonable amount of my energy bills. I'm not installing these on my roof either. I'm actually building a frame to put two of the three panels on and then the third one will be on my shed roof. So let's start by building that frame. The first task is using my drop saw to cut all of the timber to the right size for the frame itself. I'm also cutting angles or sort of sharper tips onto the pressure treated lumber that I'm using as the uprights of the posts, as well as cutting a few sort of stakes to solidify the whole thing into the ground. I'm also using some uh, outdoor treatment for uh, the sort of stakes, in fact, for the whole thing to even better protect it from the elements, especially the pieces that are going to be actively in the ground. Then we need to build the frame. I'm, I like to pre-drill all of my holes here for the sake of not splitting the lumber and I'm using a right angled bracket to hold it all in place and keep it square. I'm also using stainless steel fasteners here for the least chance of things rusting over time, you know, out in the elements. Uh, we laid the panel down onto the frame to work out the actual exact positioning, including with the uh, mounts on the panels. Uh, and then we attached the uh, two sides. I'm actually putting two of these panels on a single frame. Uh, although one of the interesting things you can test is the open circuit uh, voltage or the maximum power voltage, which is just you plug a multimeter into the two MC4 connectors and you can read the voltage. And in this case, I am reading almost exactly what it reckons is the maximum power voltage, which is perfect. It's a great way to ensure the panel is still working before you actually go and mount it to stuff, especially if you are gonna put it on your roof, it's worth doing but we got both of the panels down and then it was time to actually mount them. They do come with effectively self-tapping screws. They have sort of small flats on the front to act like a drill bit. But again, I kind of like to pre-drill everything for the sake of just definitely not splitting any of the wood. So I pre-drilled all of the holes and then got to mounting them. Now the way that I'm planning on installing this frame is to sink some posts into the ground uh, along with those stakes to hold them in place and then mount the whole thing up uh, just with some stainless steel bolts, nuts and washers so that I can then adjust the tilt of those panels throughout the course of the year. This is me driving in one of those stakes and I must admit, 
pretty tiring task, but I'm happy to say that the whole frame and assembly is both easily removable, which is great because this is a rented property, and it's remarkably secure. Now we realized that before we actually put the main sort of two panel uh, array, if you like, up, we should probably put the third panel that's going on my shed roof on first. So we laid the panel down, I got to pre-drilling some of the holes and installing some of the fasteners. I needed to borrow a, uh, a neighbor's ladder for this one just to get uh, right up at the top. Uh, and I'm, I am planning on adding some uh, reinforcing on the inside of the shed roof. It's not necessary or absolutely essential, but the shed was a bit of a, um, oh, a bodge to get built in the first place. Uh, so it's probably worth adding as much reinforcement as I can get. The panels are about 21 kilos each, so it's not the heaviest thing. And obviously that's very well distributed across basically the, the entire side of the roof, but I feel like it is likely worth adding a bit of extra support. With that said, uh, it is remarkably easy to get these panels installed, especially with the mounting kit. It's just uh, two screws per bracket uh, to actually mount it to a surface. It comes with those screws. So that's really easy and really simple. So that's it mounted. We did make sure to fish out both of the connectors before we actually fully seated the, uh, the panel on the shed as otherwise we'd probably have a hard time getting those connectors out. This is me drilling some of the potentially adjustable holes for the uh, sort of panel array if you like. Uh, I'm just enlarging them here as they weren't quite the right size. Next was actually mounting the whole assembly. Now, we wanted to wait until we'd built the frame before we actually put all of the posts in the ground, although as you can see, we did slightly get one wrong and it's sort of bowed out there, but it ends up working okay. Now, like I said, I'm just using some stainless steel nuts, washers, and bolts to hold this in place, one per side, and the theory is that at uh, some point later in the year when the sun is a little bit lower and I might want to tilt those panels further, I can basically drill a couple more holes further down at the front or further up at the back to tilt that whole assembly a little bit more and get a bit more efficiency out of the panels even in the, the winter months. The next step is installing the solar charge controller. This is a Renogy Rover 60 amp unit and uh, I'm just mounting it to the shelf that I just freshly built in the shed. Uh, this is obviously uh, upright, which means that the heat sinks will work fine on the back and it's pretty secure, so I'm pretty happy with that. Actually getting everything mounted up is relatively easy. The next bit is the sort of, well, I guess, more dangerous part, if you like, as we're starting to play with the battery and all of the relatively high voltage connections, including from the solar panels. You can see all of the attachment points here. These are massive screw terminals. Although actually one thing, since I am building my own battery, I'm using a BMS or a battery management system, which requires all of these tiny little leads to be able to monitor each individual cell's voltage to keep everything protected and, and balanced. Although actually speaking of balancing, I ended up needing a second board for that. So we'll talk about that later. Now these cells are EVE uh, brand 280 amp hour lithium iron phosphate cells or LIFEPO4 cells. And these are uh, very good for, for this sort of use. I do need to make it clear, like I said, that this is not a guide or tutorial. You should use proper insulated tools. Do not do what I'm doing. I am, well, an idiot enough to, to roughly, you know, be confident in my actions, but uh, it's not a, a set of actions I would recommend for anyone else. With that said, what I'm doing is attaching the bus bars between each of the cells. These eight cells are all in series, so all of the voltages add up. Uh, so we get a total of around about 28-ish volts when fully charged, and obviously 280 amp hours worth of capacity. Uh, and that means that we have something around eight kilowatt hours 
of energy storage. Now I've also attached all of the balance leads here to each of the uh, individual batteries uh, and then we attach that to the charge controller. It's really important that you attach the battery to the charge controller first before connecting the solar panels. It's also worth doing the initial setup on the charge controller too, setting the battery type to lithium ion, in this case lithium ion phosphate, but that's fine, and setting the capacity to make sure that's right too. I did end up coming back and changing some of the charging voltages, but here is the key moment where we actually connected the solar panels to the charge controller, and you can see our first bit of power being generated, and nearly 500 watts almost instantly. That's fantastic, and we'll talk a bit more about the, the results uh, in a minute, but I'm very happy to see this actually live and running. One part of the build I didn't end up filming was uh, hooking up the inverter and all of the in-house wiring. I'm using armored cabling from the shed to a junction box just outside my house, and then standard twin and earth inside the house. I made the mistake of buying a modified sine wave inverter at first, so I had to return that and get a proper pure sine wave inverter instead. This one is rated for 3000 watts continuous or up to 6000 watts peak for about 10 milliseconds. That's plenty for the single 13 amp plug face that I'm planning on running this whole thing with. Something I want to note about the battery setup is that the BMS, despite having balance leads connected and in theory is capable of balancing, just won't. So I bought a separate balance board, which has been absolutely fantastic. The BMS still protects from under and over voltage, overcharge and over discharge. It just doesn't also balance the cells, kind of like it should. So how much power am I making here? Well, the charge controller reported a peak of 1310 watts, which is about 10% more than the panels are rated for, which is fantastic. As for how much power I'm using, well, as it stands, I'm running my AC, my fridge, and my washing machine and dishwasher off of it. Although I'm gonna be doing a third video making the whole system a, a little bit smarter and connected to Home Assistant so I can monitor battery capacity overnight and see if it makes sense to also move the around 300 watts of PCs that run 24 seven in my office to that too for even better power savings. Finally, let's talk cost. I spent £717 on the three Trino Vertex S 400 watt panels, including £110 for delivery. The charge controller was 220 and another 90 for the mounting kit, which includes the, the uh, long MC4 leads and the battery hookup leads. The EVE 280 amp hour cells were £171 each after tax and delivery, so £1,360 eight pounds in total. The BMS was around 128, the battery balance board was about 32, the cable entry glands were just shy of 20 pounds, the stainless steel nuts, bolts, washers, screws, all that sort of stuff came to something about 20 pounds as well. Uh, the wood was right around 100 for all of it, the inverter was 306 pounds, and I also bought some extra MC4 cables for 17 pounds each, and spent another about 40 pounds or so on the cabling and plug faces for inside the house and getting to the house. And all of that adds up to just shy of 3,000 pounds. Now, the big question is, what's my return on investment type? Well, if I can offset an average of 400 watts all day, every day, something that I think is pretty achievable with the panels and the battery specs, especially at the new rate that electricity will be starting at in October, I'll have made my money back in a year and a half. If Ofgem do double the price cap again in January, like we kind of expect them to, then I'll possibly be under a year for return on investment time, which is insane. For context, I'm generally using between 700 and 800 watts pretty much constantly in my house, so cutting that in half well, literally halves my bill. The other benefit is that we should have, uh, well, we shouldn't have any issues uh, with, you know, if the power does happen to drop out, especially in January, like we kind of expect then I now have a backup solution that will keep everything essential running and could even provide us some heat, fairly limited, but could provide us at least some 
to last out that any power outages we might have. So that's a look at my new solar power system. Like I said, I'm going to do a follow up video adding some smarts to this so that I can monitor and track everything in Home Assistant. So make sure you're subscribed with the bell notification icon so you don't miss that. I'm going to go into more detail in that video about the energy and cost savings that I'm making as I'm hoping to track that through Home Assistant. So again, stay tuned. With that said, that is kind of it for at least what I've got so far in my, my solar project. Like I made it clear at the start, this is not a tutorial. Uh, I should make it abundantly clear I am an idiot with enough knowledge to be dangerous and happily I haven't you know, managed to put myself in too much danger, but at the same time, I cannot recommend a exactly how I've done everything to literally anyone else. So uh, very much do as I say, not as I do. And uh, if you listen to anything in this video, listen to that. If you're not sure, get a qualified person to do it for you. Okay, with that said, that's pretty much it. If you want to check out the other video, I'll leave that on the end cards and obviously plenty of other more standard tech videos on the channel as well. Uh, if you want to support my EDC, then feel free to check out the uh, links in the description. You can pick up a t-shirt like this one, you can become a YouTube member or a patron, a load of other stuff, different affiliate links and all that too. So yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.